welcome to Olsam 1M. For this episode, we look at the impacts of urbanization and how the country is dealing with it. We also feature the government's proposed housing scheme in partnership with BSP, as well as the relocation of the Paga Hill settlers. Papua New Guinea started urbanizing during colonial times, uh, mainly starting with the colonial administration uh, buildings, uh, which were set up by uh, colonial masters uh, for their administration purposes. Uh, very few businesses existed at that time. But as the country grew and expanded, uh, the administrative centers became uh, major towns and cities. Uh, private sector employment increased, uh, more education institutions propped up, and so more people were joining the workforce and joining the towns and cities. So um, the number of people, uh, a ratio of population uh, from rural to urban began to change uh, from maybe hardly anybody in the 60s uh, to now around 15, 16%. And the vast majority of that uh, is in Port Moresby. Urbanization simply means an increase in population in cities and towns versus rural areas. We can also say that it is the physical growth of urban areas as a result of global change. People move constantly each day from rural to urban areas and these are due to various reasons. The thought of getting better employment and income opportunities is one example. Lack of basic infrastructure and services and the deterioration in economic conditions around the country are a contributing factor to people migrating from rural to urban areas. Uh, many of them move for economic reasons. That where they are staying or living is uh, not as good as what they perceive will be in towns and cities. So economic reasons include business, doing business, Economic inclu uh, reasons include uh, employment. Uh, they may include uh, better living standards, uh, include uh, better education services, health services, uh, and maybe uh, uh, good homes with lights and water, running water. These are the things that attract people to uh, come to towns and cities. People tend to move to urban centers as they are known to have better services. But there are also services in urban areas that are slowly deteriorating. Aurora Primary and Elementary School in Port Moresby has had issues with electricity, water supply, poor toilet conditions, and lack of classrooms. There are about five elementary classes that do not have classrooms, forcing them to learn outside in the open environment. And inside the school, we need um, our toilets to be fixed. We don't have enough uh, electricity flowing into our classrooms, like less of power. We don't have uh, easy pay. And for teachers to type our testers, we don't have powers to come inside. The problems here in schools that we are facing is classroom shortage. As you can see, we have five classes outside, and that is elementary two, and we have been educating these children for some good donkey years, ten years outside the classrooms. And they are instructed outside and not inside. When we have bad weather like rain, wind and dust, I normally suspend the school because of their health. So if you can see around, we are now calling upon our electorate member for Northwest that he could come around and look into the situation and help us out with classrooms. And that's our problem here in the school. So I have tried my best to use some of TFF money to put up the classroom that you can see. It's not uh, completed. We have wallings and flooring yet to complete and it's still standing. As you can see now, we have a very big increase in the population. So you are going to see that uh, when you go into the classrooms, you are going to see that all the classrooms are flooded with students. Teachers, there's no space to move around. So due to the population increase, it also comes with problems. People are excited about the government pre-education policy. 
and they are sending all the students to school without the government uh, providing the necessary infrastructure needed like classrooms and toilets and all this. So we are having a really hard time. Okay, name Blomi, I'm Rose Deboro. Uh, big black girl Blomi, I'm school, this last school, now I'm staff at Lay Unitech. Second one, I'm staff at Tokara High School. Third one, I make a grade for Ororo Community School. Okay. Lo here, I'm plus uh, facing toilet bagger up, classroom, over the classroom, and bagger up, desk, brook. Na wara too, I'm plus a problem, lo wara. Na books too, all chokes too, no got sample time, all teacher, but sit outside. Don't know, apply any more picking in. And big plus problem, I'm come up with this last school. There are also challenges in rapid urbanization and increasing population growth. Some of these challenges include inadequate housing and overcrowding, competition of water and land, inadequate sanitation, air and water pollution, poverty and deprivation and natural disasters, crime and diseases, and environmental degradation. Welcome back to Awesome One M as we look into the impacts of urbanization. Human beings need air, water, food, and of course, a roof over their head. However, for many people, it is becoming very, very difficult to find an affordable accommodation. Uh, in Central New Island, we play that big place to housing. Housing now becomes an issue because plenty long old houses which used to be all properties for housing commission. Now all tenants only been occupied, only buy them out, finish. Me not think about me like in stable towns, suppose me like stable this like in life where rental fee work like eating me like one side. At the same time, price like all kike now work like one tab na affecting me like all the man mere. We have a lot of uh, settlements uh, in Port Mosby which have not been planned properly. That is why people are suffering from water, they're suffering from uh, other uh, health uh, facilities and basic or essential services. The number of people moving into towns and cities over the years has increased. Thus, finding affordable accommodation is a serious issue. There is a huge demand for residential housing within the lower market. The demand on the lower market is, is a lot uh, and we're looking at in the 500 up towards the, uh, the 1500 2000 mark. Um, in the upper level between um, four to upwards it's sort of quieting down a bit at the moment isn't it? Uh, I'd be right saying that. Um, and I think that's because uh, a lot of, you know, I think, <coughs> It is because there's a lot of supply, okay, and um, the demand is in the lower market and not the high market, okay. There's a lot of new buildings, a um, lot of uh, landlords are now smart and they have been um, renovating their properties to near new and they are getting, um, getting uh, the, the rates that they are asking for, in the, which, whichever market that they are in. Okay, so there's different levels of market. You know, you look at um, all different areas of Boroko. You know, Boroko, you're looking between the uh, 800 to 3,000 per week. Um, in Gordon's area, you'd be looking around the same areas. Uh, but if you go to the town area, you'd be looking up at the top, probably about um, 1,500 being the lowest, depending on the location in town. You know, if you're looking at Conidobo area between you know 1500 2000 if you're going up to uh, Togo Bay area you're looking at four to eight thousand so it depends on the area of the location That's there's been a mismatch um, imbalance between uh, the uh, availability availability of affordable housing uh, affordable housing because nobody has been building affordable housing when National Housing Corporation stopped building and institutional houses were given away in giveaway schemes. 
there has been very little uh, growth of stock of affordable housing. So uh, when you don't have affordable housing, when you don't have an uh, institution that's constantly supplying housing to the housing market, uh, housing is provided by the market, and market is driven by supply and demand. If there are people willing to pay, uh, then the prices of houses increase, and uh, that also for land, they increase. So now we have our graduates from the universities too are looking for houses. So if they can get it through the formal sector, then they have to get it. Uh, get their accommodation needs uh, from the informal sector. So the informal sector is a growing industry because of that. In 2010, it was reported that there were 20 planned settlements in Port Mosby and 79 unplanned settlements. This is according to the United Nations Habitat document on Port Mosby's urban profile. Back then, the city had a population of just over 400,000 people, 45% of whom lived in settlements. But now so much has changed. And despite the fact that housing loans are available in various financial institutions, it is still very difficult for many people to obtain one. I think um, not many people are able to, to get a home loan due to the, the high cost of housing and properties in, in the country. Other contributing factors are, are non-availability of land, um, inability to provide equity. Uh, the market has experienced rising property prices in the last four to five years, but we've seen recently that rental prices have started to decline. But despite this, the, the overall property market prices have, have not decreased. Um, this is because although there is still the demand, the supply of, of housing is low. And this lack of supply is, uh, is keeping our property prices um, high and home ownership out of many people's grasp. Welcome back to Awesome 1M. There has been several eviction notices given out to settlements in Port Mosby. As we all know, this can be a very difficult time for those who reside in these areas. Paga Hill settlers, for one, have been lucky enough to be relocated by the Paga Hill Development Company, which is not the case for many who have been evicted in other areas. We now take a look at where they were, where they are now, and what do they hope for the future. Paga Hill was alienated state land until people settled here in the 1960s. A few years later, Paga Hill Development Company got the land title to this land. In 2012, a court order was given to settlers at Paga Hill to evict the area. They were given 45 days to live, however many refused, which led to what former politician Dame Carol Kudu described, a demolition. Back then, she intervened as she was still a member of parliament. I intervened because I was still a member. I had phone calls from there and I could hear gunshots and things. Um, I did ring a couple of other M uh, people interested in the area, but they didn't want to go in. So I, I had no alternative. I, I went in because they are uh, our people of Papua New Guinea and they were people in my constituency. And it, it was basically, as I said at the time, this is a demolition, this is not an eviction. And uh, the police were being very heavy handed. And so I went in there on a human rights ground. It wasn't really questioning uh, their right to live there. Um, although I did in those early times question the uh, process of subsuming the titles into one title, but the National Court has now spoken on that. Uh, so yeah, I went in on human rights ground and for 15 years as the member, I had told them always, you cannot live here forever. This is uh, inner city area, you are marked by the NCD urban plan for relocation. So I was, for 15 years, I was always honest for them. I never did any infrastructural development because that was my policy, not to do infrastructural development on areas that were marked for relocation. In um, 2012, after depth of consultation with the settlers on site and their leaders, orders were taken out from the district court to, to uh, 
relocate them. But um, when that um, consent orders that they wanted to um, agree to relocate failed, we went to court to seek orders for police to involve. And um, whilst we went on to use police um, following the process and procedures under the District Court Act, uh, District Court and um, uh, Samaria Jackman Act, um, the settlers went to national court and actually got a stay order on the um, on on the eviction exercise. So actually, that eviction didn't continue; it stopped there. It's almost a shock uh, because. As a human being, once you've got a job, once you've got a roof over your head, you're somebody. But once those two things are taken away from you, you actually are nobody. And uh, in a situation, in this time, you couldn't be going to impose on your relatives to take you in. They've got their own situation. And I'd appreciate it if uh, we were put in a little shed, I don't mind, with water and electricity running. But uh, this is not to say that I'm not grateful to the company for at least providing a place for us. But the location where it is, it's quite, you know, away from the bus stop and it's, it's difficult. I haven't been to work since uh, Monday and I don't intend to go to work until I've got something over my head. The Paga Hill area is home to those who have settled here and a commercial site for Paga Hill developers who are the leaseholder. But apart from that, this area is significant for its World War II background. The remains of World War II are still visible. Some people have even made the World War II bunkers into their homes. Today, Paga Hill has been cleared out by the developers Trees and houses have been cleared, and residents have been relocated to Six Mile. The Paga Hill Development Company has gone out of its way to relocate people and provide water, electricity, and is also giving them a land title to the land they have been relocated to. And Paga Hill Development Company's vision is to, is to create a site at Six Mile that settlers will one day appreciate that um, that what we promised to them, that they will um, move to a site provided to them with basic water, with power, with um, roads gone into it, um, is provided to them. And that's our, that's our vision, and we've already started that. While we have the vision, what we need is uh, full cooperation from all the stakeholders involved. Pablo Miem. Uh, 1978, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, I'm sorry, driving tractor and cleaning my Me more than 38 or 39 years now. So, what's me and me? I'm begging for me, me little monkey, me say stop. Me say round lame, so, this is a service where company, he bring him come inside. Lo here, plenty of money got against the comments against him company, but, Somehow, I'm second mention, but this company want them settlers. I'm nature working, so company come back and lo me, and me been agree with them company. Uh, resettlement things have been done with mining companies where people are moved off their land, their traditional land and things, but uh, this, uh, doing a proper planned relocation for a settlement eviction area, it's, it's as far as I know, probably pretty new uh, in the sense of providing. Usually, what happens is that the company involved will just tell people, pack up your house, where do you want us to take you? And they take them and put them there. This is much, much more than that. And, and now too, um, Curtin Brothers are also involved in this process as well. And I'm actually uh, working with both companies probably in the end, which is good so that we get a uniform approach to how we develop a model. There are various impacts of urbanization. The question now is how do we deal with some of the problems that arise with it? The government for one has made plans to enable a housing scheme through the BSP Bank. We now take a look at this housing scheme.
Um, the PNG government has, uh, has approached BSB offering support to the bank to enable greater access to longer term home funding, reduced interest costs and fees to be specifically allocated for, for first time owner occupied home buyers to, to build their own house. So what, what's happening is that the government is depositing funds with BSP to address the, the liquidity and the, and the market risk around the pricing of loans at 4% at interest for, for 40 years. By placing the deposit with BSP, the government is addressing a gap that exists in the PNG market for, for long-term deposits. And by doing so, this allows BSP to <coughs> to mitigate the, the underlying liquidity and the market risk that will be associated with a long-term uh, fixed rate loan. And these loans are not government guaranteed. Um, furthermore, BSB is, is not acting as an agent for the government, rather, and, and it's not responsible for, for developing or marketing any housing schemes. Uh, these are the, the responsibility of, of other private sector participants in the housing industry. The Papua New Guinea government and the Bank of South Pacific are working towards making home ownership more affordable and easier for Papua New Guineans. This has been proposed under the first home ownership scheme. Um, the term of the loan um, is for, the, for those that are eligible will be a maximum of, of 40 years. So this first home ownership scheme as it's being called is going to be available to, to all Papua New Guineans for, for owner-occupied homes, uh, with the loan terms providing flexibility to, to include the, the support of family members to, to assist with loan repayments, um, bearing in mind that the loan will be monitored the, the same way as any other loan issued by the bank, and it will be subject to the, to the normal recovery processes in the case of default. According to the Bank of South Pacific, this loan can be taken out on a range of amounts, and the product is open to all Papua New Guineans both in the public and private sector. Apart from that, we are still faced with other challenges in terms of urbanization. In the next 10 years, um, there really is a need for the government to take an active role. Uh, like I said uh, before, they need to release that, make it possible for housing estates to be created for the ordinary Papua New Guinea. And when there's more supply in terms of land and housing, then the price will come down for those people. And then that's where the affordability factor comes in. And people will be able to afford to, to rent decent homes or even buy a home for their family. Um, and, and the demand will keep increasing because People are continually to, are drawn to Port Mosby. When we are like, I think at the moment, over a million people. In 10 years' time, it could be 2 million or even more. So um, if, if nothing happens, a housing will become a major problem. It is already a major problem. It's going to become an even bigger problem. The population, of course, like all of these uh, settlement communities, I don't like using the term settlement. It's always negative. These communities has expanded enormously from the original in colonial times. And that's a, a problem, that a challenge that our urban authorities everywhere in this nation face. That they've grown so much and we need to, need to get a way to manage it. Uh, we are a private company, as you know. Um, we have orders of the court, especially to um, remove the people on the top part of the hill, the former National Housing Commission people. And there is no um, legal obligation for us to provide um, what we have so far provided and what we uh, have vision to provide. But it is, like I said, a public development company's corporate uh, uh, vision. And it is our, um, our treatment to Papua New Guineans that we want to do right by them so that we continue to be, uh, be, be good corporate citizens. And that's all we have time for on All Samoana. If you have any comments or stories you would like to share, please contact us via the address on your screen or visit us on our Facebook page. For now, enjoy the rest of your viewing on your number one station, MTV.